young people realize that it's not a question of protest, it is a matter of life and death here. generals that make history, but the masses of the people, the workers, the peasants, the doctors, the lawyers, the clergy, all our people, I have seen them making history. Africa! I am By 1907, it had become quite clear that both the, the Bure and the Britons were agreeing to form one government over the whole of South Africa, but on the understanding that the Africans would be kept out of the Africa of the franchise. The 1910 Union Constitution dashed all hopes for democracy in the new South Africa. Appeals to the British Crown had failed. A new era in South African politics was to begin. In 1910, the Africans were canvassing amongst themselves the formation of an organization which they regarded as a parliament for Africans in uh, contrast to the parliament which had been formed by the whites in 1910. And so the African National Congress was formed. Hmm. 
heard uh, people like um, Dr. P. Kassem, uh, Dr. John Dube, uh, Dr. Hobosem. These were men who received their training abroad. And their conception of a political organization was influenced by the policies of uh, the countries where they were trained, British Parliament, American Congress, uh, the Parliament in Holland, French Parliament. The NC leaders of the time were also influenced by their education and mission schools. Now, there's an area in the Eastern Cape which I usually refer to as the bowl of learning. Love Day was already producing teachers and tradesmen who were trained in all the fields of building, printing, carpentry, and so on. It was from here, from those institutions, that teachers came out and spread to the other provinces. It was this influential group that brought to the fore new questions about the ideals of non-racial society. Right from the establishment of the uh, political uh, organization, the idea was an idea of one society the people of South Africa. The new Congress was tested by white determination to limit black access to land. The 1913 Land Act prevented African people from owning land or farming in all except the reserve areas. These were less than 8% of the country's land. This was an act of dispossession. The, the act was, in fact, finalizing a process that had already taken place because at the end of the wars of this dispossession, the Africans had been driven back into the areas where, by 1910, they were, and where today they are as Bantustans. The Land Act legalized the outcome of 200 years of war between colonists and African tribes. The wars of resistance still burned in the national memory. Generations of ANC leaders have been inspired by the Bambata Rebellion. Well, precisely, that is why one of my grandchildren is called Bambata. Uh, Bambata is a very famous name, and uh, his uh, rebellion against uh, white domination and uh, the poll tax, and his collaboration with King Denizul is a very fascinating episode. The Bambata rebellion. Uh, has inspired many freedom fighters. The colonial authorities have imposed a new poll tax on the people of Natal. Bambata and his followers refused to pay. They fled to the forest and waged war on the government. By the end of the war, 4,000 Africans had died. The king was on trial for sedition and the Zulu people conquered. The authorities beheaded Bambata and paraded their trophy across the land. My father was uh, one of uh, those who were involved who fought in uh, Nkandla Forest under the command of uh, Skananda. But uh, of a special interest to me, is uh, that according to the old chap, Bambata did not die at Nkansi. 
he disappeared in the forest and nobody knew where he died. Pombata was killed, but uh, if you killed Pombata, then people would be left in despair. So people always maintain Pombata wasn't killed to keep the idea of resistance on. Here again, it was a question of land, a question of labor. Tax was introduced for the purpose of getting the people in the reserves to go and look for work in the areas, industrial areas. And therefore, you see the pattern is the same right through. It is the pattern today. Land still plays a very important part today. It's one of the problems that we will face even when we do finally install the government of the people. The 1913 Land Act had immediate and drastic consequences. ANC Salt Archie cycled across the felt and found dispossessed families wandering, homeless in the land of their birth. They said it's winter in the Native Land Act. In winter the trees are stripped and leafless. This act seems like a one-edged sword. It cuts a big piece of the native and is very gentle with the European. Plaichi led an ANC delegation to the British Crown, but their appeals for land were brushed aside. The land act um, was very, very cruel. Because uh, it made people um, to feel that they were no longer cared by the government and um, uh, the government was taking away the last thing they had, and that was the land. After the Land Act, uh, people, all people, all able-bodied people, were forced out to go out and work. The new gold mines on the rent were hungry for cheap, unskilled labor. This also links up with the migrant labor system. They were forced to go out to seek work outside the reserves. Then the law made it impossible for them to settle where they were working. It pushed them back. They lived alone in single quarters, saving money to support their families on the crowded land. In every town, there is a native license office. All natives coming into town must get a license. Here you see the men queuing up at the licensing office in Johannesburg. All natives must carry their license and show it on demand to a policeman. Post law was the most humiliating piece of legislation. You will see people lined up behind them. Everybody looked at them like uh, the real criminals. And he's arrested for what? He isn't got a permit to be in Johannesburg. I have experienced several times the question of being stopped in the street and I'm asked for a pass. Sometimes the pass is left in a jacket. They're not concerned with that. They take you straight to jail. It's a, it was a terrible thing. If there's anything that made criminals of the, of, of the, of the African people, it was the question of the passes. And that is why the pass laws form the basis of our struggle. The first people to resist the pass laws were women from the Orange Free State. You now see that the women gave a lead, a remarkable lead, in uh, fighting against the passes and going to jail. They inspire men in 1919. And men now began to resist uh, in an organized way, the passes. Violent police action ended the pass campaign and led to serious conflicts in the ANC leadership. 
those from the Transvaal now started talking more of action. But those who are following this Christian ethic were condemning that and that it was going to bring no good results. So this was the beginning of the contradictions within the national movement itself. In 1921, a religious group gathered on municipal ground in the Eastern Cape. Their prophet had foreseen the second coming of the Lord. Local farmers were enraged by what they saw as a Bolshevik land grab. The government was demanding that the Israelites should move. Kungo ba sa sala inda belanga lekhi tikle shal esi esi esenzi ngalonga pambi esi enga pambi esi enzi esi sala inda belanga yangu peli paska simke kodo ngoksi esa sala inda belanga lekhi telo kesha. Like many other millenarian movements before and after, the leader of the Israelites uh, preached that uh, the millennium was about to dawn and he had seen many signs of the coming of the millennium, one of which was Halley's Comet, which was sighted over South Africa around about that time. And in 1921, uh, he uh, preached to his followers all the themes of redemption, salvation, uh, uh, redemption from sin, uh, redemption from bondage, the bondage of sin, and then the bondage of slavery. Uh, very, very powerful and emotive themes. The Smuts government brought in the troops who opened fire on the pilgrims. <laughs> At the end of the day, nearly 200 lay dead on the plains of Bullhook. Their white neighbors rejoiced. Street. I was really outraged for so many people to be mowed down simply because they did not want to move from a particular place. If they were whites, I have no doubt, I had no doubt that uh, different methods of moving them away uh, from that area would have been used. It deflated the prestige in which uh, we regarded smuts. And from that incident, I was never uh, enthusiastic uh, over him. The 20th. In the town's resistance was brewing. White South Africans were at the ready. The new class of black workers was finding its feet. 
During the First World War, the cost of living doubled, but the black miners' wages stayed the same. They could no longer support their rural family. It was time to strike. Skilled miners, many from Britain, rejected new technology which threatened to give their jobs to blacks. In 1922, they declared a general strike. Prime Minister Smith called out the troops. There was fighting and shooting in the Ren town. After four days, the strikers were defeated. Across the land, a new black trade union was growing, the Industrial and Commercial Union. They turned this ICU into a slogan. In our old language, it says, uh, it means that I saw, I see you, white men. You have robbed us of our land. Then many people joined. They went to cattles and uh, 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 joined the ICU. My father was one of them. My father used to tell me that now we have joined this organization because we want to take over our land which we have robbed. What began as a dock workers' union rapidly became a national political movement. During the 1920s, with the rise of the ICU, uh, I suppose one could talk of the urbanized African working class for the first time flexing its muscle and uh, beginning to acquire a sense of its own strength and power and uh, perhaps uh, a better appreciation of uh, what the real relations of power were in the society. ICU leader Kadali told workers, your bosses have a nice time of your labor which is cheap and abundant. You are sweating to make the white man's world a paradise while you are condemned to live in hell. Their press is against us because we plan to eat the forbidden fruit at the center of the garden. The ANC was overtaken by the more militant methods and the more able leadership of Kadali. But it was still now considered as, he, as too moderate. The ICU swept across the rural areas like a felt fire, using unusual organizing methods. They sold a wild dream of redemption to a powerless people. They were given yellow cards. And we were told that if uh, one hasn't got the card, uh, the Americans, Americans were coming and they are going to destroy, kill all the white people and the, peop and the, the black people will take over their land. There was that idea that they were going to come in aeroplanes in order to liberate the black people. If you didn't have this cut on the top of your house on the day, then you'd perish because spears would descend from the sky and kill all those who didn't have these cards. At its peak, the ICU had 100,000 members, but strike action was met with strong repression by the government and by white civilians. By 1929, white fear enabled Herzog to win power on a black peril platform. The ICU was in decline. It was for a short time. I suppose that's why that someone describes it as like a felt fire. A felt fire doesn't last long. By the middle of the 30s, the ICU was waning. During this period, the Communist Party began to Africanize. It called for an independent black republic. One has to remember that the first political party in South Africa that struggled for democratic rights was the Communist Party. And the first political party were people of all races. 
could belong. And it became not a party of the few whites who had broken away from the Labour Party and formed the International Socialist League and later on in 1921 the Communist Party, but a party of African workers. ANC's Josiah Gumedev visited the Soviet Union. He returned saying he had seen the new Jerusalem. Probably he was a bit rash. And when he came back, he was president of the ANC then. He started telling them about what he saw and uh, what a good thing it would be for South Africa. Then the chiefs were up in arms against him. You think uh, my milk boy can sit together with me and tell me what to do? And they didn't like those people who were murderers who killed the king and the queen. So it became unpopular that he was unseated by the conservatives. Fellow Africanders, if perchance today there is felt in South Africa a certain measure of anxiety, let it not be forgotten that there have been times of anxious care in the history of our fatherland, when by experience we learned to know that in South Africa there never is a night of storm not followed by a day of joyous sunshine. I recollect very clearly that in the years of 32 to 34, with a serious drought that had uh, afflicted large parts of the country, many, many families, Afrikaans families, uh, trekked, if I may use this Afrikaans word, through Grafrenet, either in an ox wagon or a donkey wagon, or even just with donkeys and with a few horses or with a little cart on their way to Port Elizabeth. The drought and the depression had forced them off the land and they just came as they were with the little belongings that they had. devastated by the Great Depression. The people were really hungry. I mean, there were soup, soup kitchens established, not to the extent the cities now, very few. And, and there was poverty, and the people lived in shacks. And I tell you, during winter time, with the Cape rains and the cold winds, uh, it was terrible. We shall walk through Black and white the people flooded into towns to sell their labor. But the Afrikaners could make no common cause with their fellow countrymen. But the main reason was the whole way in which we were educated to see, you know, the African community. Unconsciously, you saw that person to be a second-rate human being. And that therefore, the values, uh, the hopes, the demands, the rights and the dignities which you accorded and demanded for yourself, it never entered your head that they had the right, you know, to be seen in a similar light. It was this, I think, tragedy of the Afrikaner people, but that we never really saw that what was happening to us, that we could transplant it and say, but heavens, let's open our eyes, look what is happening to them. The ANC was raining on the people, emphasizing petitions and deputations, and uh, the ordinary person could not lead such uh, deputations because uh, you needed someone who was learned who could speak the language. The ordinary men couldn't. And the, the ANC became the organization of the learned. Look, it was the hungry years, the depression, 1930, 31, 
people were hungry, there was no jobs. While the white unemployed were demanding help from their government, black political organizations were in disarray. Torn by internal conflict, the ANC had declined to just a handful of members. Herzog's government was determined to remove the last vestige of democracy, the African vote in the Cape. The All-African Convention was formed to fight the bill. They sent a futile delegation to the Prime Minister under the leadership of Professor Jababu. They were not even given seats. The whole interview, they were on their feet. And uh, when Professor Jababu was asked uh, to present the case. Um, the situation was uh, such that uh, he did not even have uh, the courage to look at uh, Herzog, and uh, he closed his eyes as he was talking to him. Um, but um, Herzog treated our delegation very shabbily. The Depression years had given momentum to the Africana nationalist movement. The Bruder Bond was inspired to raise funds for the poor urban Africana. It was a sharing in which every Africana family was asked to make a small contribution to the material welfare, to building up a little trust fund or some form of support for the Africana people. In 1938, they celebrated the 100th year of the Great Trek. Like their forefathers, they made the long journey from the Cape to Pretoria in Oxwego. The aim of the trek was to unite all Africans. They were sitting there saying, freedom, freedom, British Empire, freedom, British imperialist, freedom. But I didn't understand what type of freedom they were wanting. Otherwise, I could have sympathized with them if I knew that they want to be free. And what they were doing at that time is what we're doing now, which they arrest us and kill us for. I think the 1938 uh, track reenactment played a vital, I would say, a decisive role in the whole process of Afrikaner and nationalism, leading eventually to the victory of the Nationalist Party in 1948. It became a massive upsurge of national pride, of the revitalization of all the old cultural and religious values of the Afrikaner people. At the end of the trek, National Party leader Malan told his followers that it was now the duty of the Africana to strive to make South Africa a white man's land. I am speaking to you from the cabinet room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. In October 1941, it was one of my friends who joined. I say, you are now a driver. He says, yes, I was very much interested in driving. Then uh, I said, how much do you pay to drive? He says, no, it's free. They even pay you. 
you get money for, 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 for learning to drive. So I was interested with the fear that the Germans were coming to kill us when they come here. I also joined the army. That was in 1941, October the 10th. Black soldiers joined up in their thousands, fighting for freedom and democracy. The refusal to train them with firearms became a burning grievance. They gave us guns, but they didn't show us where the trigger is how to aim, which I've learned now, uh, how to shoot. You just carry the gun and they tell us, you see the Japanese, they can fight from top and uh, the yellow people, and you are going to fight them. So they teach us nothing, absolutely nothing. Back home, industry was rapidly expanding to meet the needs of the war. It drew in huge numbers of new workers, white women and black men. At that time, most of the things came from uh, England. The Buttersby hat, which was the most expensive hat for good people, the type of uh, Churchillian hat, it was a Buttersby hat. Buttersby, London, Buttersby, London, and most of the things, like the bicycles, also made in London. But during the war, uh, it was not possible to have the uh, things ordered from overseas, so that South Africa then started uh, with the industrial. It was almost something like an industrial revolution. Rural people flocked into the cities for wartime jobs. A new working class was in the making. The trade union movement revived, and the Communist Party was revitalized. Many of its members were active in the growing trade union. A new generation of black activists was coming to maturity. We found uh, stairways in Pretoria, stairways in Bloemfontein. The, the mood of, of militants developed throughout the country, and that had its big impact on the ANC, led to the formation of the Youth League, who came with new ideas. Although it was narrow nationalism, it was nationalism that wanted action. They're on the warpath, these Bantu dancers, on the warpath to raise funds for the Victory Thanksgiving appeal. This effort to raise funds is a special one carried out by the non-European residents of Benoni. Expectations were high. Black people were certain that war victory would bring them freedom. Smart said uh, the passes would be abolished. After the war, there would be no pass. Passes would uh, be abolished. Even John Smart have said that after the war, uh, we'll get a better jobs and higher wages, and uh, the pass law will be finished. A large crowd gathers at the Durban docks to welcome home a contingent of 2,000 Springbok soldiers from the fighting front. In a Victory Day broadcast, General Smuts paid a tribute to the fighting nations of the world. As we believe in God, let us, in our rejoicing and in our thanksgiving today, render thanks for the victory that is ours. All well, people were very much disappointed. For instance, uh, the, the whites were given houses, areas like that area of uh, Tefontein and other places, but the blacks were only given bicycles. And they were given bicycles as a compensation and they were very, very, very much disappointed. It was no more the talk of every freedom for every individual. It was quite a different thing. Nothing was offered. Some of them, they were brave. Uh, they did very brave other things and they got medals. And when they come back, they were given nothing. I personally went to some meeting of the ANC and some friends went to organize. When they speak, they speak against the government. I said, now this is the right organization that I should join and fight these people because we got nothing. 
And I, I think most of them went and joined the uh, ANC because of that, or organized more people into the ANC to see that uh, the only way through is to overthrow this very present government. Under a new leader, Dr. Tuma, the ANC was revitalized. A new democratic constitution was adopted. The old guard drafted their first charter calling for universal franchise, African claims. That is one of the most important uh, documents, even when you compare it now with uh, documents like the Freedom Charter. Well, it was really an, imp an important document at that time because it met more or less, but uh, it did not go deep into the minds of the people because the people are generally disturbed by what happens to them daily. Like in a case of today, the people do respond to wages, housing. If you talk about freedom in general, I mean, it does uh, give them something, but they want something that specifically affects them day, day by day. A short way out of Johannesburg is Shantytown, mushroom city of rags and patches, poverty and squalor, which sprang up overnight as a new home for nearly 15,000 natives. The nucleus came from the neighboring native township of Orlando, which can be seen in the distance. In the manner of a biblical exodus, their leader, Sofazanke and Panza, led the natives into the wilderness which became Shanty Town. He led them from Orlando as a protest, he said, because there were not enough houses for all to live in. In some houses, as many as ten people lived in one cottage. The whole sea of Orlando, so we took today, is in fact as a result of a work started by Panza. Even ANC was not fully behind Panda, but the Youth League was. The whole Youth League, its, uh, its stronghold, was Orlando, where the squatter movement was taking place. And without there being any sharp differences between the elderly leadership and the Youth League, there was some difference in that uh, this was something that was happening before our eyes. When we went uh, to work and from work, you know, we passed through these quarter camps and we couldn't avoid uh, being interested. Uh, Dr. Kuma lived in Sofar town where there was a freehold and uh, no squatter camps. And uh, it was not a matter which was really a priority to him and the rest of the African leadership. They were concerned with broader questions throughout the country. We were concerned with the squatting movement, which was in our township. Shanty towns sprang up across the country. Women formed the backbone of the movement. They had come to town to join their men, and they were determined to stay. The authorities were powerless to stop the squatter. The political organizations of the day were also unsure of this new movement. It's difficult to imagine uh, what particular directions they would have taken it in because it was, in a sense, a movement of massive civil disobedience. And not just civil disobedience, uh, which, uh, you know, with the prospect of uh, it coming to an end at some point. The prospect was that if the authorities remained in transit and it would go on, uh, you know, until one or other side became worn out. After the Second World War, the Smart government introduced new legislation to segregate the Indian community. The Ghetto Act restricted access to land and business rights. The Indian community declared a nationwide campaign built on their own tradition of passive resistance in South Africa. The new laws were deliberately broken. So we were all arrested. So they took us to the police station and they kept uh, the whole night there. Urine smell, I can't even sleep. It was such a terrible. And the next morning they brought us to the court. So we were, um, what they called, charged and then were present for a month. When I went, my children were very small. So I just left my children like that. My youngest son was 18 months old when I went to prison. When I came back from prison, he didn't even know, he didn't want to come to me. 
I felt, felt very hurt. But in the other end, I was very proud because I'm not sorry I went to jail because it's for a good thing we went, isn't it? <laughs> the passive resistance campaign continued for over two years. People defied apartheid boundaries and crossed provincial borders. Over 2,000 went to jail. Well, I was carried away by the uh, feelings there. Uh, I must say that uh, in all the years that uh, we have been in the movement, I can't remember a single campaign which was as effective from the point of view of reaching out to the people as that was. Uh, one can say that it literally, literally reached every Indian home uh, so that uh, people were mobilized. I felt very bad that uh, I was unable myself uh, to do something similar and uh, and I saw also families I knew went to jail not once but twice and others thrice and uh, they were able to teach us that a person could go to jail and come out alive and be prepared to go back again. Because uh, during those days, in spite of the fact that uh, we were in the struggle, to go to jail was something, you know, that uh, was a disaster. But uh, the Indian community in this country taught us that you could actually challenge uh, a power such as uh, the government and still come out alive. It had that impact. It actually influenced the defense campaign of 1952. The passive resistance campaign cemented the growing non-racial alliance. The foundation for a decade of defiance was firm. Smart's government was riding between the militant demands of the new urban working class and the fears of the white farmers and workers. The National Party presented voters with a vision of white supremacy. The result of South Africa's general election is worldwide news. And the fact that Field Marshal Smuts, seen here on Table Mountain during the royal tour, has lost his seat has been a tremendous sensation. We wake up one morning, we are told that Malan has won the election. And that meant that he shut the door on our faces. Fruit Skier, the Prime Minister's residence in Cape Town, awaits the arrival of the newly elected Premier and his family. Following a handsome welcome at the railway station and a drive through the streets, Dr. and Mrs. Milan were in high spirits. I was overjoyed, together with hundreds and thousands of African people, because I had felt that in a very specific way, we had achieved the goal for which so many of us had worked for so many years. Dear Milan, Shouts, a party, a party, keep them apart, put the kefas where they should be. Comrade Oliver and I came out of Park Station that morning and bought a newspaper and learned that uh, the National Party had won. And Comrade uh, Oliver said, well, I like this uh, because uh, it is going to put further momentum to the resistance movement. We now know that uh, we have an enemy in power and difficult days are coming for us. 
And I think that we're going to have a better opportunity of mobilizing our people.